The United States has always sort of had an identity crisis. Who are we? What are we? And how do we look to the outside world? And central to this national level imposter syndrome complex is an unusual fixation with architectural aesthetic beauty, especially when it comes to government buildings and monuments. Even before Americans were collecting antiques, our founding fathers sought to recreate the ancient world in the United States by making Washington DC a new Rome on the Potomac. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and others not only adopted systems of government and law from the classical, especially Roman world, but they also built a capital city that in many cases is a copy-paste plagiarism of ancient Rome, and then later Athens in its architecture, sculpture, and painted interiors. Take Horatio Greeno's 1841 sculpture of George Washington, for example, the original Washington Monument, Designed to sit at the center of the Capitol's rotunda, it was modeled on the 5th century BCE cult statue of Zeus from his sanctuary at Olympia in Greece. Although in a quirky turn of events, Naked George, as he was mockingly referred to as, offended American sensibilities. So today, this adaptation of Greek art has been relegated to the halls of history. And instead, an Egyptian-inspired obelisk memorializes our first president, which is also kind of weird when you think about it. But the fixation with a national archetype for our federal architecture has become renewed in recent years, and our civic structures are once again the canvas for a reignited culture war battle. So throughout this video, I'm going to be sharing with you some pictures of modern American federal architecture, the good, the bad, and the may be ugly, and let you decide down in the comment section below. What is beautiful anyway? And at the end of the day, is decrying a national architectural type inspirational to democratic ideals or just plain plagiarism? Well, let's take a look. If you take a look around the United States, it's pretty difficult to argue that we don't like to plagiarize European architecture. Sure, some of these examples are more successful than others, but the US has loved the costume that copying European architecture provides. However, in the architectural tapestry of the United States, a specific striking thread is its long-standing fascination with ancient Greek and Roman architecture. From the majestic Doric columns of the Lincoln Memorial, the Triple Bay Roman Triumphal Arch at Washington Central Train Depot, to the full-scale replica of the Parthenon in Nashville. Yeah, seriously. The Greek and Roman architectural styles specifically have become the de facto symbols of American ideals and aspirations. So why exactly did my fellow Americans, when looking towards all of the different architectural types that they could throughout the world, why did they turn so emphatically to an archetype that is quite literally millennia old? Well, at the time, the US had a bit of a PR problem. In the early years of the nation, we were the new kid on the block. And while a lack of history and tradition did offer us the ability to create all new from a blank slate, it didn't offer up a lot of precedence or reverence either. By adopting elements from Greek and Roman architecture, our founding fathers forged a connection with a revered ancient civilization, lending legitimacy and a sense of historical continuity to our young republic. And this was especially important during a time when the European world powers still dominated the global stage, and America was in a lot of ways kind of striving to keep up with them. The use of Greek styles in public buildings, such as courthouses, banks, and educational institutions, was not just an aesthetic choice, but a deliberate attempt to infuse these structures with the democratic gravitas of ancient Greece. But it's also important to point out that although we like to call these men the American founding fathers, 
the vast majority of these men were quite frankly very European, not only in their upbringing, but in their education as well. Classical subjects and motifs were a mainstay of their visual vocabulary, so they used this imagery in public art to construct new American narratives and identities. In short, these historical figures, ideas, art, and architecture of antiquity were not only examples to be emulated and adapted, but also equaled. But it also makes me think, now that we are some 250-ish years since the founding of our nation, why do we still rely so heavily on this architectural style from ancient civilizations? I mean, wouldn't it be more egalitarian, I suppose, to pick an architectural style that represents who we are today and not one maybe that quite literally sits on a pedestal? Well, we kind of did for a while. For years, there wasn't a great deal of partisan difference between the way Democrats and Republicans approached the aesthetics of government buildings. For better or for worse, federal architecture reflected the design trends of the day, rather than the party in power. And that led to famously polarizing federal buildings like the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, the Alphonse M. D'Amato Courthouse in Islip, New York, the Department of Energy in Washington, and the U.S. Federal Building in San Francisco. But just like just about everything in American discourse today, trying to reach a consensus or a compromise, even on something as innocent as architectural detailing, ends up being just incredibly polarizing. Beautiful. Massive. The biggest ever in our country. And it's going to be beautiful. Beautiful. And it's going to be beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful building. In the waning days of his administration, then-President Donald Trump signed an executive order with a broad but vague mandate. All new federal buildings must be, quote-unquote, beautiful. The December 2020 order fell short of an earlier draft that would have required all courthouses, administrative offices, and other federal projects to be done in a classical style, effectively banning modern architecture for federal developments. While some of this stricter language did make its way into solicitations from the General Services Administration, Trump's proposal for a ban on modernist civic architecture never came to pass. And upon his election, President Joe Biden swiftly overturned the beautiful order. And that was the end of that. Or so it seemed. But then, in the summer of 2023, Republicans in both the House and the Senate introduced legislation to once again make classical European architecture the preferred house style for federal buildings. The Beautifying Federal Civil Architecture Act, introduced by the Senate by Senator Marco Rubio and in the House by Representative Jim Banks, would restore Trump's lame duck version for a Council on Improving Federal Civic Architecture and calls for federal buildings that, quote, uplift and beautify public spaces and inspire the human spirit, suggesting that only classical design can, quote unquote, ennoble the United States. The bill stated that blueprints derived the forms, principles, and architecture of Greek and Roman antiquity would have the government's official favor. And it defines classical architecture by listing an encyclopedia's worth of practitioners, even those from the Renaissance like Brunelleschi, who designed the Duomo in Florence, Italy. Notably, the bill did not ban modernist buildings outright but it singles out a couple of disfavored late 20th century styles, brutalism and deconstructivism, for an extra burdensome layer of red tape. And while I think we might come to a comfortable majority on general distaste for certain federal building styles, to completely ban outright deconstructivist or brutalist or to make it a lot harder for modernist civic structures to be built, is just distasteful, in my opinion, because one, there are good and bad examples of every architectural style, but two, beauty is subjective and constantly changes. Buildings today that are celebrated and beloved, buildings that we probably couldn't even imagine our modern city skylines today without them, were probably hated for a little while. The most famous example is, of course, the Eiffel Tower, which was despised by Parisians as a scar on the face of Paris when it was first erected. Now, 
I'm not saying that the Department of Housing and Urban Development Building is the next Eiffel Tower, but I don't hate it either. And I would actually argue that a building like that one doesn't need to be torn down. It just needs a little bit more time and probably a little extra maintenance in order to be celebrated just as much as any other part of the architectural imprint of the city. For example, the French Second Empire style Eisenhower Executive Office Building, built next to the White House in the 1870s, does kind of awkwardly clash with its neoclassical neighbor. It actually spent years as one of Washington's most hated buildings, called the greatest monstrosity in America even by Henry Truman. But today, the Eisenhower Building is thought of as a charming and celebrated part of the city's architectural fabric. Things evolve, and that's sort of my point. And if you'll allow me just to give a little bit of a comparison, I think that buildings in a lot of ways aren't all that different from classic cars. Are some cars more well-executed than others? Sure, absolutely. Are some cars uglier than others? Uh, yeah, but just like cars of all different makes and models do kind of become maybe old and gross after 20 years, but start to become classic and cool after 40, I would wager that a lot of our buildings just need time rather than tearing down. After all, that building I showed earlier of the HUD headquarters was designed by Marcel Breuer, one of the most celebrated modernist designers of all time the Bauhaus designer who fled Nazi Germany for the United States and became the successful architect that is credited with helping to make the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University the success it is today. Isn't that exactly the kind of stories that we want behind our federal buildings? So why is it exactly that this obsession with Greco-Roman architecture has begun to rear its head again today in the 21st century? I mean, I would probably wager after all that if you're a European person watching this video, you probably think that, wow, the United States Congress must be sitting pretty comfortable if they have the time and energy to debate things as to whether or not columns should be Corinthian or Doric, right? <sighs> But unfortunately, this discussion doesn't come out of nowhere, so to speak. It, the, unfortunately, it's just another symptom of larger polarization that's happening within American politics. There's a weird, dark, and quite frankly, alt-right part of the internet where you're likely to encounter a lot of references to ancient Greece and Rome. There's a fascination with Spartan culture and Stoic philosophers and famous thinkers like Aristotle and Plato. And the men who consume this stuff tend to believe two things, that ancient Greek and Roman culture is the basis of Western civilization, and that these cultures specifically are the exclusive achievements of white men. And no, I don't believe that it's suddenly a coincidence that the look of federal buildings became the focus of a populist inflicted campaign against architectural elites and the bureaucrats who hired them. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that liking Greco-Roman architecture automatically makes you an alt-right conspiracy theorist. I think there is a very real argument to be had, one that I actually brought up earlier in this video, that our founding fathers chose the specific style because they wanted to hearken back to ancient Roman Greece because of the qualities that that particular style of architecture brought. And it's okay to think that that is beautiful. I just think we need to tread very carefully. In elevating the stature of Greek and Roman-inspired buildings favored by Thomas Jefferson and his cohort, it does support a backward-looking posture in a country that has always been about dynamic change. And lest we not forget that a similar fetish for columns and pediments was also associated with the 20th century totalitarians who imposed triumphal redesigns on cities like Berlin and Rome in the name of showcasing militarist ambitions. So I do think there's actually a very strong argument to be had that mandating a particular style, especially this one, is a very undemocratic thing to do. And that's precisely the reaction which was given by the American Institute of Architects, who wrote in strong opposition to such a mandate. 
stating essentially that these kind of laws stifle freedom of design and artistic expression. What elevates a building to a piece of architecture, in my opinion, is that it's able to transcend merely its functional attributes and actually become kind of a living example of the culture and climate in which it was produced. And yeah, I get that's kind of a flowery description, I'll admit. But I think what makes great buildings great is that they act kind of like livable art. Art that was made within a very specific time and context. I think we can all agree that we love beautiful architecture, but beauty is imperfect. It's diverse, and it speaks to its audience much in the same way that more traditional art forms do as well. And I think we all would probably find it utterly lame and boring if all of the art galleries only entertained classical works of art, right? I actually want to wrap up this video by giving you a few specific examples of buildings that have been planned, developed, and constructed during this more tumultuous time for American federal architecture, those that were actually in the planning stages during the Trump administration and that had to deal with this classical design mandate. And I wanna ask you, do you think these are beautiful? The first is the federal courthouse in the works for Fort Lauderdale. Funny enough, this is actually Rubio's home state, one of the authors of the exact bill that I talked about in this video. This building was designed and planned during the exact same time when the GSA under Trump explicitly asked for classical designs in solicitation for the project. So at minimum, this courthouse does represent how one high profile firm might comply with a traditional design mandate, albeit one that's highly subjective. The elegant symmetrical design for the $196 million courthouse features fluted columns of metal and glass, as well as an arcade supported by a colonnade. According to the project's architects, the global firm SOM, the building design draws upon principles of classical architecture, but with a contemporary interpretation of Corinthian columns. So is this the kind of neoclassical architecture that Republicans have in mind? Is this beautiful? The next is the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, dubbed by some the most successful new public building in Washington. Designed by a Ghanaian British architect, technically speaking, the building is somewhat classical. It has a base and a capital like a column. But at the same time, it includes patterns on the facade which borrow from ironwork by Southern slaves and the facade, canted, three-tiered structure derives from West African sculptural traditions. The design is a kind of mediation on the symbolic meanings of American classicism and how style functions as a symbol of pride or a tool of oppression and colonialism, from which modernism, with its transparent glass and technical innovation, promised escape and liberation. Keep in mind, this bronze building is also quite the statement when you experience it within its total environment. It's a warm, glowing standout amongst a phalanx of gray stone behemoths that align the National Mall, all of which, by the way, are quite frankly classically designed. But under a very strict classical design mandate, would this building have made the cut? Is this beautiful? And last but not least, perhaps the most controversial building of the bunch is the Salt Lake City Federal Courthouse. The new building's shiny, sterile-looking, modernist structure was designed that way intentionally. It's extremely well lit. There's no dark hallways leading into dark courtrooms. The design concept used daylighting to take advantage of natural light. So the building has a ton of windows, and each of the courtrooms is actually built against the exterior walls but the building has received a lot of backlash, with some likening it to the central bureaucracy building from Futurama, or a gigantic air conditioner compressor, or my personal favorite, a gigantic ice cube that's coated with this sort of material that you would see on your braces when you were in junior high. But here's the thing. What I think is interesting is that the architects of the building don't actually disagree. 
The design is austere. And that was part of the message. This building is a courthouse, a statement about the justice system, something that is, yes, a good ideal for law and order, but also a place of punitive punishment. But is this beautiful? Now, I can't predict the comment section, obviously, before I publish a video, but I would wager that some of you probably love them, some of you probably hate them, but I think that's exactly how a democracy is supposed to work. There's always supposed to be this push and pull between those who want to break the mold and those who want to carry the torch of tradition. But I think what's really interesting for me personally as an American, particularly as an American who has a background in architecture, is that there's a sort of underlying question for me of now that our country is nearly 250 years old, do we really still need to be looking at architecture from antiquity or architecture from across the globe in order to give ourselves some sort of architectural legitimacy? Or is there a path forward where we now have a truly American architecture? one that's our own, one that we can define for ourselves, and one that, quite frankly, doesn't really feel like plagiarism. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from Type Ashton, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Tschüss.